This is Star Talk. Welcome to Star Talk All Stars. I'm your host, David Grinspoon, aka Dr. Funky Spoon on Twitter. And I'm here with my co host, Chuck Nice. Hey, hey, Dr. Funky Spoon. How's it going, Chuck? It's going very well, my friend, as usual. Yeah, always always fun to do this with you. And we're we're very happy today to have a special guest joining us, uh, Andrew Revkin, who yes. is um, you've probably heard about him or read his stuff. Uh, and he is an environmental journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, for years, he wrote the the Might Dot say, Earth column, at the Dot Earth blog at the New York Times. And you forgot award winning. He's an award winning, <laughs> award -winning. author, award winning the, columnist. Yes. And you know, actually, the way I think of Andy is my sort of internal title for him is I think he's the curator of the Anthropocene. Wow. We're going to talk about the Anthropocene, That's... but as much as anybody, he's chronicled <laughs> and written about and commented about for years this this weird uh, fact that we humans have started a new age on the planet. If yes. there's anybody who's sort of attempted to keep tabs on that, it's Andrew. Revkin. Oh, okay. and and uh, he's just started a new job. Actually, um, just in the last couple of weeks, he is now um, no longer doing Dot Earth. Although Dot Earth stands as an amazing archive, hopefully for for all time, <laughs> and you know, barring a nuclear disaster or something. Class. Yeah, exactly. Right. I and mean, even then, I think maybe we should have it archived on the moon. But now, uh, Andy is working for ProPublica and doing investigative journalism and Ooh. and sort of deep diving climate journalism. Maybe we'll hear a bit more about that. So, oh, that so, so he's still around and still going to be uh, curious the Anthropocene for us, and we're very glad to have you on the show, Andy. It's yeah. great to be here. It really is. Uh, it is great to have you. Uh, you know what? And before we go any further, uh, Dr. Funky Spoon, I would be remiss if I did not, since you brought up the Anthropocene. Uh, I have a book, as you can see, I've taken many notes on it. Uh, lots, wow. of, lot, lots of little uh, uh, sticky notes in here, and it's called Earth and Human Hands, Shaping Our Planet's Future uh, by um, Dr. Chuck Nice. Uh, with, no. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's by David Grinspoon, which is you. Hey, congratulations on the book, man. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks a lot. I couldn't have done it without you, though, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the last time we were together, uh, you, hmm, let me think, you were done, but this was not in print. Right. It was. It was. We, you were. You had finished the book. Uh, it was um, still awaiting release. So I think it was still with the publisher. And uh, we were talking about this. And uh, so uh, I know Andrew uh, is has done so much work with the Anthropocene. But to be honest, you were the first person who I ever got a deep dive into the Anthropocene. And so since uh, uh, I have both of you here. The first thing I would like to say or know or ask on behalf of all of those who may be unfamiliar with the term, what the hell is the Anthropocene? Yeah, well, because I've heard of the Pleistocene. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but it's actually, Anthropocene. Right? It's great having Andy here because he's almost the guy that named the Anthropocene. He uh, <laughs> he he came up with the concept. I mean, it's one of these concepts is in the air. A lot of people kind of came up with it maybe around the same time. That the notion that yeah, we've changed the Earth so much that that in terms of the 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 ways in which geologists name ages, the Jurassic, the Pleistocene, that maybe we're in a new one that humans are responsible for. But Andy actually proposed posed this many years ago, and but he called it the, the Anthracene, right? Yeah, Anthracene. You know, in 1991, I was writing my first uh, global warming book. I'd written one on the Amazon rainforest, and, and I was doing this section on cha changes, the global change, and, and I just sort of was, it was like one of those like blah, blah passages at the end of a chapter where you're just going, oh, la di da you know, organ music and stuff, and, and it was like, well, perhaps um, earth scientists of the future will name this this geological age of our own making for, for its causative element for us. And I just thought Anthropocene, I think, you can't think back to 1991, but, but it was like this, uh, the word that reflects the geological concept, mm -hmm. but also the human concept at the same time. And then like in 2000, a Nobel Prize winning chemist, <laughs> Paul Crutzen and, and Eugene Stormer kind of had a more technical and formal approach to the idea. I don't think they had read my book. It was not like a bestseller. It was the Museum of Natural History, actually. Their, oh. their first exhibition on global warming. I wrote It was the companion book for that back in 1992. 
And um, and I've been, you know, so I kind of predicted it more than more than take ownership of it, which right. is kind of nice. Well, yeah, but you've yeah, definitely that's even... been involved in the development of the idea. If, oh, yeah. Too bad your phrase didn't didn't stick though, because then you would be known as the guy that. <laughs> well, yeah, but let's see what happens. You know, Neil actually, we did a show a, lo- a while back with uh, Maeve, and uh, and I mentioned this, and he thought anthra- anthracene has a. Sm- he think he you check back. Neil said. Neil said that anthracene, anthracene is, is better. better. Simpler is better. And In a way, I, I think he's he's yeah. anthracene uh, is well. First of all, who needs that po? I was going to say you're taking out, <laughs> right. you're taking out a syllable, so you're, you're making it you're making it better right away. But even streamlining, better, streamlining, streamlining. Yeah. But even better, Nick Cave, Nick Cave, this really dark, remarkable rock song guy, oh, yeah. songwriter yeah, from yeah. Australia. He's a great he musician. has a song out now called Anthrocene. Anthrocene. Anthrocene about this. and Yeah, well, maybe in he, the long run, that'll be the word that sticks. We'll find out. After yeah. all, in geological time, <laughs> this is a blend. Yeah. <laughs> right. 100 million years 100 from million now. Years from now. <laughs> and well, you know, the nature of the name, like, as I wrote in my, I wrote this recent long magazine essay for a magazine called Anthropocene Magazine, believe it or not. On this whole thing, and I said the word is the word and the debater. It's the debate around the word that's really the most interesting thing. Absolutely. So, so now, uh, you know, that that notwithstanding, uh, whether it's Anthropocene, Anthropocene, um, or as the British say, Anthropocene. Anthropocene. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, quite. Quite. Um, what I'm interested in is uh, for someone who has been involved in this uh, subject matter for such a long period of time, you talk about 1992, mm-hmm. two things politically. One, how have things changed? Better, worse, not, uh, or, or indifferent? Uh, and two, where are we in terms of climate yeah. and uh, the climate changing from just 1992 to now? Well, you know, back in uh, 92, that era, 88, 1988, when I first wrote a long piece about climate change, back then, uh, Jim Hansen and other scientists were saying, you know, this is happening. They point to research going back 100 years. The basic physics is what it is. You know, certain gases make the world habitable, warm, you know. And, and the trajectories for emissions were up, up, up. And everyone kind of thought, well, if we just, if the scientists just say, well, the trajectory needs to be down, 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 that that, that would just happen. Like back then it was this like simplistic, well, scientists will just tell the world what to do and the world right. will do it. And the world will do it. it. Yes, yeah, so, and that, that was the first treaty, 1992, the Rio Earth Summit, the first framework convention, climate change treaty. And, and the countries of the world basically all raised their hand and pledged allegiance to avoiding dangerous we anthropogenic. We promise to stop doing this. Yeah, it was all a pledge. It was like a pledge right. of allegiance. We pledge to avoid dangerous anthropogenic right. influence on the climate system. They Scouts raised their right honor. hand. They had their other hand crossed, crossed behind their back. Yeah, crossed. yeah. And, then, and then Zoom happened. You know, we, we keep thinking that whatever was the norm was Zoom, but you know, from 1950 until 1992 was a big Zoom for emissions and environmental stuff. Right. But then from 1992, that, you know, 2000 is when China said, hey, it's our turn to Zoom. Yes. And boy, did they begin burning coal in Man. a huge way. And that, so the trajectories of these emissions are just up, up, up. And the concentration in the atmosphere is like you know, bathtubs rising, rising, rising. Right. So there's, except, there's no no clear sign of a learning curve. Except, <laughs> you know, okay. except, except the last <laughs> the last couple of years, there's the emissions have been flat. Uh, That's true. Now That's true. there are reasons for that that are a little complex, and it doesn't mean oh everything's fine. We can See, all relax now. now, now yeah. Let me but, just say this because uh, Dr. Funky Spoon, you know I adore you, and uh, you and Neil and all of your colleagues who I have met, and I've said this to all of you. Your problem is you're too damn pragmatic. <laughs> okay, your problem is you actually tell the truth about stuff and you think critically and then you say stuff like, well, the emissions have been flat. Now, that's very, it's very nuanced and it's somewhat yeah. complex. It doesn't mean that everything's... And you know all I heard? Because I'm a dumbass. Right, you just heard me all say, heard, everything's fine, don't worry. There you go. <laughs> Hang on, right. Thank you. That's the problem. That's what I heard. That's the problem. That's, that's actually, that's actually, everything's cool now. I'm missing no, I mean, the that, flat. That's actually one of the things I want to get into uh, today with this discussion is, yeah. is how we talk about these things. And it, there's a lot of paradoxes because if you say something that's, that's hopeful, and I think Andy and I have both been accused of being too hopeful <laughs> <laughs> at times. And, and I, I think there are genuine reasons for hope. There are obviously 
genuine, huge reasons for concern. Okay. But the trick is, it's very tricky because sometimes when you say something hopeful, uh, then people will willfully misinterpret that or they'll accuse you of not being alarmist enough uh -huh. and therefore people might misinterpret it. Uh, I, I feel like there's a danger in the other direction of being too dismal and sapping hope and getting people to say, oh, forget it, we're screwed, why bother to so do anything? Do you think there's but, a, a, but there a, a are interesting questions of balance here. You think there's a dismal saturation point where people would just get so um, dis, uh, 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 disheartened that they then just go, oh, F it, who cares? I mean, there's nothing that we can do about this, so right. what the hell? Well, you see right. that, you know, you Brace see that on, impact. You see that on, right. so, on yeah. social media, you know, that, that whenever... Um, <laughs> Sorry, for, guys, that, that was me. That's, oh, uh, there we go. The, that's the, the impact. Dangerous the technology, that was the impact brace, of technology. Andrew said brace for impact, and then something <laughs> fell to the, the floor. The impact of technology once on again, the floor. Once again, showing his prophetic capabilities. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I get this, and I'm, I'm sure you get it all the time when, uh, you know, you if you say something that's at all hopeful on online or you write something, you get besieged by with social media telling you like that, you know, the human race is evil and a cancer and, and you know, that like no matter what, like people get angry when you yeah. say something positive. And that's, that's an interesting phenomenon. Yes. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced that Andy. Well, yeah. And Oh yeah. I've had everything. I also had Rush Limbaugh telling me to go kill myself <laughs> on, uh, on by, air. By the way, when Rush, Congratulations. Limbaugh, I was going to say when Rush, but when Rush <laughs> yeah. Limbaugh does that, it could be, be the highest praise you could receive as a human yeah. being. <laughs> Actually, it was more like a rhetorical question. He said, if you, if Mr. Revkin of the New York Times, if you think that humans are the worst thing that ever happened to planet Earth, why don't you just kill yourself and save the planet by dying? So, so, but... But I think oh, he's so I, clever. He is. He is clever. <laughs> yeah. He tried to kind of apologize on a subsequent show, but mm -hmm. it didn't work out. Anyway, um, the science that I completely neglected to write about in my first 25 years of science writing was uh, psychology and sociology. And, mm. and that's when, um, this, is the, this is the most depressing science of all. If you want to, like, just sort of brace for impact. Okay. Don't forget about the climate science. It's like Jackson why, why humans, again. the science on what, why we do respond to some kinds of risks and why we don't respond to others, mm -hmm. why two people will look at the same body of data and have completely different views of it. That science is way more... That's scary. Scary. Yeah. And, but it's kind of like the human way, mm -hmm. which gets at this. I mean, to me, I'm thinking, having heard all this, you know, the happy people and the scared people and the angry people think about our election, you know. Um, um, I think part of what is the, the other, the, we're not all going to be happy and we're not all going to be scared or, right. or whatever. It's that's like the human way is this weird dynamic that has that tension between people yelling at each other for being too happy or, or saying, hey, you know, you're, you're really not being so down about this is not going to be energizing somewhere in that. So it's not like the middle, the end result is for everyone to be quiet and happy or quiet and neutral. It's to be engaged. Right. I agree. I think that's <laughs> in a way, if you think of the human um, cultural the whole the whole ball of wax, all of us and our effect on the planet and the various communications and interactions we have that ultimately lead to some kind of action and it's messy. If you think of that as a big consciousness, um, which you can as some sort of global consciousness, then all of that all of that um, disagreement and feeling different ways and arguing back and forth, you can look at that as the, as us making up our mind mm -hmm. globally. And you, and mind you, singular, it, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like the, yeah. the global mind. If you think of right. an individual mind, supposedly, nobody really knows how the mind works, but, but Marvin Minsky had this idea, society of mind, where different parts of your brain are you know, sort of competing and communicating with one another. And it's not, mm -hmm. it, consciousness is a messy thing, even mm -hmm. inside one person's head. So and I think like that maybe, a maybe collective, the- A collective uh, process of reasoning, hashing things out internally, like, like a mind would do? I think that that could be. And, and I find that comforting because like you say, it's like sometimes it's really disheartening the way people don't agree and everything seems so confusing. And yet, historically, if you, you know, you look at- uh, Ultimately, we do make progress and move things along, even w out of this very fragmented, fractured um, society we have. So maybe that's just, it's sort of a dialectic. That's part of the way we deal with these things, like you say, the human way. And that, that's a theme in your book, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, this emerging, uh, and this goes back to stuff I've been writing about, too, the, the, no, the idea of a newosphere, uh, this Greek word for planet, planetary mind, mm -hmm. came from like the early 20th century. Cool. A, a French theologian and a Russian geochemist 
came together on this idea of planetary consciousness being ultimately a an Earth perpetuating thing. And An another sphere. I just thought that the way the biosphere came yeah. out of the geosphere. Right. These guys said the newel sphere is this this new part of Earth, the the the, the sphere of mental activity. Okay. It's, a, it's a it's a really cool image. And that was of course way before the internet. Now we actually sort of uh, have, no, a, yeah. have a newel sphere. <laughs> and, and I was going to say that how how very uh, uh, prescient the fact that we do have that. It, it is. We are now all connected. And right. look how well it's working yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean. Oh, no. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, obviously, it's it's creating problems where you know we're not really prepared to be this globally interconnected yeah, beast. But nonetheless, um, you could look at all of this cacophony as maybe this is just what what our global mind looks like when mm -hmm. it's trying to figure things out. So let me it's ask a new both system. of you. It's a I'm going to ask both of you, and you, you yeah. you'll forgive me for being so candid because I have no other way to be. Where do stupid people fit into this equation? <laughs> well, if we go back to the analogy of the brain, <laughs> there are parts of the brain that yeah. are the, the primitive reptilian parts, You're right? Nicely done, Dr. Bucky <laughs> Spoon. Now, go with the amygdala on this one. I don't know if that's <laughs> fair to say that, you know, people in certain parts of the world are the brain stem <laughs> and other parts are the, uh, you know, the cortex. Right. Maybe that's a little elitist. Right. I don't really feel that way. But it is true that... Uh, um, it, that going back to the analogy of a mind, it's not all uniform and coherent, gotcha. right? And so that incoherence doesn't necessarily mean that we have no ability to ultimately figure out um, what we're going to do with this this role we find ourselves playing on Earth. Nice. Yeah. Well, and this gets back to the the, the evolutionary notion that um, it's our it's the diversity of responses that mm -hmm. we have to a risk or whatever that may be our most adaptive. Trait, you know, and let's not cast it maybe as stupid and smart, <laughs> but maybe as like, you know, hesitant and right. adventurous okay. and like the guy who's willing to jump off the cliff to get the bird egg or something. And, right. uh, you, you know, uh, so having that mix where there's someone, there's edge pushers and, and group huggers and worry warts and, and the person who, like my wife, my wife has been a science educator for a long time. And she said when they do field stuff, like pond study, uh -huh. there's always the kid who's the note taker right. and the kid who's the rock mover. Right. And the kid who's the whatever, you know, and that's like in any group of kids. Right. You end up with like this diverse array of like, how do we solve this problem? Yeah. And I uh, often feel that way when there's and, somebody and taking there's, it, an extreme view. Mm -hmm. I often think that's not my view, but I'm glad somebody's representing that in the conversation. And then I'm glad people are pushing back against it. And I, and uh, you know, you can name any, a lot of these technologically fraught questions like, you know, nuclear power or GMOs or something. And I, I tend to not have the extreme view, but when I hear them, I'm think I'm glad somebody's warning us about that. And that if we do proceed, we'll proceed with these people that are pushing against it, and that'll force us to do it in a very careful way. Right. So I think there's room for those extremes, even if you don't hold that extreme view. How about um, the extreme of this? The kid who says, this pond doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, then there's, you know, there, there's there's a range of views, and then there's just crazy. Okay. And that's, you know, that's, let's, we can't deny that. But anyways, uh, this is great. I think we're going to take a break now, and um, we will be back shortly with Chuck Nice and Andrew Revkin. I'm David Grinspoon, and this is Star Talk All-Stars. Welcome back to Star Talk All Stars. I'm David Grinspoon. I'm here with Chuck Nice and with Andrew Revkin, and we are talking about the Anthropocene, or maybe the Anthropocene, depending on uh, your your linguistic proclivities. The what? age of humanity on Earth and how we are dealing with ourselves as a planetary force. Don't forget the Anthropocene, and or we can simplify it to just the Anthropocene. At any rate, whatever we call it, um, we are going to now do some cosmic queries. Absolutely. We're going to take some listener questions that relate, hopefully, to this theme. Absolutely, yeah. Of course, uh, you know, when we do cosmic queries, we um, <clears throat> garner questions from all over the internet, wherever an incarnation of Star Talk may be found. And um, so uh, people just send them in. And as always, we start off with a Patreon patron question because those people support us online financially, and as a result, we give them um, first pick and crack at any questions, because, quite frankly, 
we can be bought. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so here we go. Hey, someone's uh, got to pay the bills and, and that's, to pay for these fancy microphones. That's and, right, my yeah. friend. Uh, so here we go. Um, let's go with let's go with uh, a Patreon uh, patron. I believe is uh, Jack Rushman. Um, sorry, Jack, if I'm not saying your name correctly. Is there info from outside of our solar system we can use to help our climate change issue? Have we already done that in some form? Hmm. Great question, Jack. Interesting. Yeah, great question, Jack. You're, you're, you're in my wheelhouse now as, a, as an astrobiologist who, who thinks about the, the, uh, the Anthropocene. I mean, that's basically what, what uh, my book, Earth in Human Hands, is about. It's an attempt to apply that extra planetary, extra, extraterrestrial view looking back at ourselves. You said outside the solar system. We know now that there are lots of planets outside the solar system, and that knowledge in itself certainly gives us amazing perspective because it's just something we suspected for a long time and we've only learned recently. We don't really know that much about all those planets yet to get some practical knowledge from them that would help us deal with climate change here on Earth. That, I think that's changing, and it will change over the next decade, two decades, as we develop the tools to really start to understand the atmospheres and climates of those planets. However, we've done a lot of exploring of the planets of our own solar system, and there we've definitely gained some pragmatic insights into our own climate by looking at the somewhat Earth-like planets and seeing how, for example, Mars is is frozen because it has a much weaker greenhouse effect, and Venus is is sweltering because of its strong greenhouse effect. Modeling those atmospheres and climates using the same tools we use for Earth gives us a sort of check on whether we really know what we're doing. It should Our model should work on these other planets if we're doing it right. And sometimes they don't quite work, and then we, we find ways to improve them. And that's, there, there's several specific ways in which we've learned practical things from modeling the climates of other planets that have improved our ability to, to model climate on Earth. So I'm, I'm going to say uh, yes. The answer is yes. Uh, there, there are ways. And um, I'm looking for forward to the day when um, the exoplanets are well enough known to us so that we suddenly have a hundred Earth-like planets that we know about the climates of, rather than just a few. That will be something. I think that will lead to another really era of climate understanding when we get to that point. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Way to go. Let's go to another question from, uh, how about Heidi Campbell? <clears throat> Coming to us from Facebook says, I'm thinking about moving my family from Southern California to Maine. Which region of the country will become more extreme over the next decade due to climate change? Southern California's drought and heat or Maine's long, cold winters. Yeah, how about that, Andy? Where should people move? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm sure all the real estate agents are going to hang on your answer yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Not to I, mention the insurance companies. <laughs> away from the coast is a starting point um, because mm -hmm. of rising sea levels. One of the most basic aspects of the climate reality is that a warming planet has less ice and more more um, uh, sea rise. Right. Uh, the pace of that is still highly uncertain. But but here's a discouraging part of the answer to your question, which is that one of the, the hardest things for climate models to do that they're still really bad at is regional forecasting like, wow. and precipitation. So uh, temperature is easier to understand. Um, but when you get specific, like, you know, should, should what's going to be the snowstorms in Chicago even 30 years from now, let alone 100 years from now, uh, highly uncertain. Change is inevitable, but complexity of the system means it's going to be really hard to make those, those answers uh, clear cut. I will say Southern California, if you're living in a zone that's prone to fire, you shouldn't probably be there anyway. And moving, learning how to live with those hazards, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hazards in the climate system are implicit. And paleoclimatology, looking at past climates, reveals a lot about the risks you might be in wherever you are. Um, mm -hmm. So going forward, you can judge, make some good judgments on where to live or how to live based on that information, even with, even with the uncertainty around global warming itself. Yeah, I mean, there are a few places you could probably um, imagine, say, with sea level rise, there are pretty good, pretty bad bets for the future. There's some, some regions. But yeah. like you say, anywhere that it, you're dependent on really understanding what's going to happen with the regional weather, mm -hmm. uh, we're just not at that level of predictability. So now, since she's uh, brought up Southern California, this is just <clears throat> uh, my follow-up question. Um, Southern California, California, period, uh, I believe is like the fourth, fourth or sixth 
largest economy in the world, and um, feeds pretty much all of America, is eating food from California, uh, not to mention drinking wine from California. So right. when you look at the amount of real estate that this state takes up on the coastline of the Pacific, how dangerous is climate change to uh, our economy and our survival with respect to agriculture and the amount of um, uh, uh, GDP that we glean from just California? As California goes, so goes the country, we often hear. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, is that um, particularly true with respect to uh, climate projections and the, and the well, possible vulnerability of our economy and our, uh, our agricultural system? What do you think, Andy? Well, one thing I try to do in all these cases is look at, like, what are, why is a certain kind of Calif agriculture where it is? And then you look at California and you realize that there are a lot of things that are being grown there that shouldn't be grown there mm -hmm. because it's fundamentally a drought-prone state. Right. Uh, you look back at, the again, the, the ancient climate history there is – Shows you that the 20th century, when California, as we know it now, got created, you right. know, with all those mansions and farms, that was anomalous. It was, it's actually a much drier place. So, um, like, looking at subsidies, why, you know, why is there, why are there rice farmers or alfalfa farmers <laughs> growing water-intensive crops or the almonds? almonds. Every, everyone heard about the almonds. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, there are scientists in the southeast, uh, in, in, uh, in Alabama, who are saying, hey, you know, maybe this is a good time to think about bringing the agriculture to where the water is. We have lots of agri we have lots of water down here. Yeah, well, so, maybe a little too much water sometimes. Sometimes, look yeah. look at all the flooding down there. You know, that's I know, an interesting way to look at it, that maybe some of the corrections that need to happen or, or some of the disruption will actually be corrections that make sense as far as what happens right. where mm -hmm. and not a disaster in the long run. Although in the short run, whenever you're having people whose livelihoods are dependent on things being the way they are, get displaced. But as far as whether it's ultimately a tragedy, if there's another place more appropriate that those things can be grown, yeah. that's maybe a slightly more hopeful way to think about and it. Wine, and that's the case with wine right now. Wine, right. wine also... They've learned that the microclimate, like on the side of a hill, can be really different from one, even in within some California Valley. They'll be like, mm -hmm. you'll find your place to grow some variety of wine, grape, somewhere. And going into the future, you know, those countries, England, there are other countries that are saying, hey, ooh, we're going to have good wine here. Uh, right. it, it, <coughs> farmers are like the most adaptable business people on the planet in history. You know, they've always found a way. Uh, not That doesn't mean that like in sub-Saharan Africa, that people are going to be able to feed themselves with current knowledge and stuff. So finding ways, looking around the world, where can you reduce vulnerability? While we work on this big grand issue of getting the carbon out of our energy system, what can we do to make sure we still stay true to that sustainable development goal for ending mm -hmm. you know, hunger in, in Africa and places like that? With that in mind, I'm, I'm going to get right back to the queries from our, our yeah. listeners. I'm sorry, but i got to ask this question because you guys keep bringing up these awesome things. Okay, so now you talk about the adaptability of farmers and you talk about how, you know, we have the ability to perhaps move some things around and so forth. Brings me to um, a quote made by our soon-to-be Secretary of State at the time that we are uh, recording this. So Rex Tillerson said, and this is a direct quote, uh, this is an engineering problem. That's not paraphrasing. An yeah. engineering problem is what he said, is what climate change is. So can you, is he correct in that? Well, in a certain sense, I would say, yes, he's correct, but that it depends. That is what I wanted to hear! But I'll it, give you a slightly different it depends what you mean by engineering. Yeah. Okay. If we're talking, and probably Rex Tosin is not going to be a fan of what I would say next, which okay. is if you're including social engineering, and uh, if you consider the fact that education and changing our way of life and changing our patterns of consumption and our conception of how we relate to um, to the the landscape and the climate and the uh, you know the, our sources and sinks of materials, in a sense, that's a kind of engineering. But it's engineering our society in in new ways. So that's that is yes, I would say it's an engineering problem, but it's not just a problem. I think of geoengineering, like yeah, let's squirt some stuff into yeah. the atmosphere and not worry about it. That might be what some people would mean when they said it's an engineering problem. Mm. I think I have a problem with with that conception. I don't know. What what, what do you think? 
complicated. Oh, Is this well, an engineering problem? Well, I, you know, one thing I've learned through, through the nine years of blogging I did on Dot Earth and through everything else is uh, uh, there, there's not anything I can think of except that we will all die someday as it being a yes, no question. I mean, it's, it's a definitive answer. Um, and that may not, you know, who knows Maybe where that's going to go right. if we all end up downloaded. Cryogenics. Right, I was going to say, yeah, cryogenics, <laughs> download your consciousness. Right, into and the then internet. there we go. So right. that, that might not even hold. But so, but, you know, uh, we do need uh, one of the most enduring debates in the whole climate question is how much of this is about deploying what we have today, solar panels and wind farms and geothermal and and to those who accept it, nuclear power, mm -hmm. and, and and how much of it is um, um, coming up with new advances with and you know new breakthroughs to have and to have uh, solar panels that are so cheap that Elon Musk doesn't have to make a big show about making a roof out of them, that it just is the roof already. Right. And you don't even Every think about it. Every roof is a solar panel. Yeah, because right. until you don't have to think about it and until you don't have to be as rich as the buyers of his battery packs and cars and stuff, right. it's not going to be a solved problem. Right. So, so what's the dynamic there? How much of this is just politics, meaning there are many who will say, we just need to shut up those deniers or whatever you want to call them, um, and then all will be well. Um, that isn't going to work in a place like India, where there's 300 million people right now, the mm -hmm. population of the United States, who have no electricity. And then there's uh, another few hundred million who don't have any reliable electricity. Mm -hmm. They need engineering. <laughs> they need, And some of that will be cool, local, distributed solar things. And right. some of that will be a power plant like we have, uh, even right here in Brooklyn, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is... How do you do that without carbon in the mix? That's an engineering challenge. So, right. and I don't think there's an easy answer there. The um, politics clearly, you know, if someone controls, if the politics is not a fair playing field, you'll end up with special interests, especially if that's the existing paradigm. You know, right. fossil power plant, wire, stereo, you know, right. or whatever. Um, they have the advantage already of it being the norm. Yeah, I mean, right. you, you can't just like uninvent suburbia. Right. That ain't going to happen. Exactly. So, so they're already in power, essentially, through both the political inertia and, and systemic inertia. So how do you galvanize things? It's an open question. How do you move forward? How do you move forward? It's, some of the, it's like what I said earlier, you know, there'll be this dynamic tension between Bill Gates on one end and... And um, there, the uh, and Satan on the other. Well, uh, Bill, uh, no, like I'm Bill. Joking. Well, let's say Bill McKibben. You know, Bill, Bill McKibben and Bill Gates. Bill McKibben and Bill, Bill, McKibben Gates. And Bill Gates kind approach. of bracket the, the, the one is universe. we're just going to innovate yeah. and solve things, and the other is we're going to restrain ourselves right. yeah. and solve things, and it's going to be some combination of those two, isn't it? I think so. awesome. All right. Um, I don't feel any better. No, I'm joking. <laughs> well, yeah, that's part of what we wanted. That is, that's, that's, that is part of the show, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's. Um, we're we're going to make you feel better by the end of the show, Chuck. All right. I'm, I'm going to hold you to that. Uh, let's go to Travis Sheaves, uh, also coming to us from uh, Facebook. And Travis says, hey, it's Travis from Vancouver here. My question is, do you think we have reached the point of no return uh -huh. in climate change? In other words, is it too late to reverse the damage humans have done? to our planet. Now, you hear a lot of this, this, this so-called tipping point. Yeah. Um, I've read a lot about it, but, you know, I really don't. I, the more I read about it, the more confused I get about the tipping point, to be honest. That means you got it. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. No, that, you're, that, that, <laughs> Seriously. that way li lies wisdom, young, <laughs> young, young <Padawan>. Jedi. <laughs> young Padawan. <laughs> young Padawan. Confu through confusion, you will find enlightenment. <laughs> no, uh, th the fact is... Um, there's, uh, there really is um, no simple tipping point uh, in a system with lots of positive and negative feedbacks, reinforcing and and uh, dampening things. Uh, there, uh, it's it's too complex to just say there's one tipping point. Which isn't to say we have to not worry about triggering some positive feedback if the methane starts coming out of the polar ice fields uh -huh. or so forth, and then that reinforces warming. That could be trouble. But uh, when people say, "Oh, we're off the cliff," we're we've hit the tipping point, point of no return, that's kind of an oversimplification of the actual very complex system uh -huh. that the, the Earth system is. Uh, we'll get back into this uh, this question in, in a few minutes, but I think uh, we're, we're at a time now where we need to take a little break. Okay. So um, we, uh, we'll come back and we'll talk more about the, uh, the complex Earth system and, and, and what we are going to maybe do about it. Uh, you're listening to Star Talk All Stars, and we'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to Star Talk All Stars. 
I'm David Grinspoon, a.k.a. Dr. Funky Spoon on Twitter. I'm with Chuck Nice. Hey, hey. At Chuck Nice Comic. Thank you, sir. And we've got as our special guest Andrew Revkin, who on Twitter is at Revkin. Bingo. That's really uh, that's really catchy. You must have gotten like into that. Twitter like very early. I was an early adapter. Early adapter. Really ad- you were an yeah. early adapter to be able to get your last name just like that at Revkin. No numbers. No nothing. Oh, you know what's no. really funny? My older son, who's a a DJ and works in visual effects. He he's now at Revkin underscore official. So he's Revkin official. <laughs> he's, the official. He, he's like nudging into yeah, my territory. Yeah, exactly. I kind of like it. Oh, that's go Daniel. Funny. Go Daniel. That's funny. About, Revkin official. So so yeah, we were talking about um, are we going off a cliff? Yeah. Is this the point of no return? And that that is something that that one hears, but it is kind of an oversimplification. But it brings us actually to a topic that I wanted to get into a little bit because we have. Andy here, and Andy and I are both people that have been at times accused of being too optimistic or maybe not being pessimistic enough on this subject. Uh, There are certain people, uh, including some very um, distinguished and loud voices out there on the interwebs and in the uh, global discussion about the Anthropocene, who get really offended and mad if you say something about how, if you say there's, well, there's potential to turn this in a good direction, ultimately. They get, they literally get angry if you say that there could ultimately be something good about the Anthropocene. And my take on this, that, you know, so I wanted to talk about this question of optimism, pessimism, what's realistic, what's helpful, what's not. My take on this, and this is one of the big themes of, of Earth in Human Hands, is that the cosmic view, the long-term view, reinforces a sort of comforting positive view, both in terms of the long-term history of looking at climate history and looking at our own history as a species, the way we've reinvented ourselves at times in response to existential threats and found new ways to cooperate on new scales and invent new social and material technologies. In my view, that's kind of what we need to do. We need to make that next leap and get better at cooperating on a global scale. And there are a lot of, believe it or not, trends that are leading us in the right direction for that. And my view is that if we think about the 22nd and the 23rd century, there are reasons to think that we may actually get to a good place, which is not to diminish the challenges of the 21st century or the, you know, the horrors that we may be in store for. It's to say, let's keep a vision of where we really want to get as a global species in our minds as we deal with these struggles. And that's both comforting and and I think actually pragmatically useful, not just to think of the world we want to avoid, but what kind of a world do we want to create? Hmm. So that's kind of my take on this. Andy, I I know you've been involved in this a lot, and I've seen you involved in some, um, I don't want to say fights, what's a more uh, polite way, some disagreements with some some very uh, (laughs) persistent voices in this community of environmental ethicists and so forth, who, who have taken exception when you've said that the Anthropocene doesn't have to be bad. Well, you know, uh, so much of it comes down to definitions and stuff. Clive Hamilton, one of the critics who called me one of the people who called me delusional. uh, (laughs) Any anyone who thinks there's a good path in the Anthropocene is delusional. Um, I I think, but this gets to the question of good, you know, and it's simplistic. The simplistic way is to say, well, I'm talking about a good path in a difficult time. That's easy, you know, like World War II, people forged good lives, even though the world was going coming unglued. But we can get beyond that, like. Uh, I, I spent time a year ago at this place near Vienna called the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Sounds like a party town. Yes, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Although they like it. they bring in music. They had like classical music performances. It's a complex systems analysis place, and okay. and they they study the human fu- human futures by running all kinds of scenarios and computers. Uh, where they have climate change and biodiversity loss and all these things. And they have trajectories. There are scenarios. Uh, they've written this papers on this stuff um, that have the world in 2300 as um, basically having like 2 billion pretty happy people and tons of room for nature and nothing calamitous in between now and then. 
Wow. Like, I in like other words, that idea. Now, wait a minute. I know. I, mean, I, mean, I was going to say, now, that's an actual computer simulation, or, <laughs> or that's some dude just going, Dear Diary. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> well, I mean, the, 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 end, the end state sounds completely believable to me. I mean, sure. if you look at climate projections, most climate projections show climate peaking later this century. And starting to decline, and peaking for the right reasons because of fertility declining, emissions, because yeah. uh, uh, well, climate and emissions. Yeah, mm. uh, I'm sorry, population. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I, I, I said climate. I meant population. That most projections show population peaking and then starting to decline mm-hmm. because uh, of for the right reasons. Because fertility is declining because standard of, of living globally are rising, especially in some of some of these places that are the most poor. Either and, way, it is a decline in emissions. Well, that's that's yeah. right. Right, exactly. No, right. Emissions right. will follow population, but not in a simple way because standards of living go up. People want more I was energy. Making a sex joke so completely yeah. different. Oh, I, oh you're yeah, talking yeah. about right. yeah. Well, but that did, obviously did you say population or population? <laughs> there you go. That obviously is related to fertility. I'm not okay. going to deny that. Listen, you're yeah. the one who, who bought fecundity into this. Oh, that's right. Go. That's right. So, so one could see that that you know the population I is going to. Andrew's, Andrew's never done a show with me. He's sitting here just like, I think Chuck is crazy. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I love it. No, no. Right. He's, he, I think he's digging it. <laughs> totally. So, so go ahead. So, so, so population is plausibly going to start to decline. And it's an interesting question of what what would we want it to be? I mean, mm-hmm. I, yeah. that's something I always ask people. And nobody's – a lot of people just haven't really thought about it. But then uh, – and energy is clearly going to transform. We can't stay on fossil fuels for centuries and centuries because there won't be any. Right. So even if we're as stupid as we can be, which I know, Chuck, you're thinking, well, that's we probably will be. <laughs> we, we're going to have to transform it. So so we're going to get to a world where the different energy system and a lower population. Yeah. So that's believable to me. Okay. The avoiding calamity along the way is, that's an interesting, I'm not totally convinced. Well, just, but there's ways to run those numbers. Uh, intensification of agriculture, like getting more crops out of the same amount of land is already leading to what they call peak farmland. Peak farmland is like, you know, like peak oil, whatever. It right. means you don't have to keep chopping down more forests to grow more food. And that's already happening. We're seeing that happen. Um, the, the calamity right now is related to the things that could facilitate having a smoother ride. The calamity in Nigeria is that you have a very high fertility rate. Girls are not getting – the main reason is girls can't go through high school. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the same people at IASA, this place in Vienna, they focused on the, the, the vital need for something. This is – how non-technological is this? How non-engineering is this? It's getting girls through high school is the single best way to basically have better outcomes all around, you know, health, um, lower fertility rates. Right. And not because someone enforced it, not because yeah. someone said you can't have more kids. And, and, and Nigeria, without – Girls getting through high school is the difference between, um, well, by like 2070 or so, having 300 million people in Nigeria or close to 800 million people just wow, in just Nigeria. Just wow. high school. Yeah. So, that, and that, so that's really stark. And then going back to this question, is it an engineering problem but that Rex Tillerson said? Well, yeah. how do you get girls through high school? That that's a, It's a problem. You could... You could look at it as a I kind of engineering problem. Well, but, but yeah. it's not, I only know it's how not, we get them through college. It's not building gizmos. Yeah, right. It's a different kind of problem. Right checks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. No. Wow. So there are there are paths, and then that that tells me there's things you can work on. That, that and by the way, that isn't like the climate campaign community is not clamoring for girls' education in in Nigeria. Right. When I think. Uh, a sensible way to look at this problem is to say, well, by, and by the way, if you want to reduce vulnerability to climate hazards, mm-hmm. meaning people in harm's way in sub-Saharan Africa, the, the same thing, the same process, get more education, lower fertility rates means your family will have an easier time of withstanding um, a, a drought or a famine or that kind of thing. Absolutely. So it's all like a no-brainer, but it requires this broader way of looking at the engineering problem, as you were saying. Right. Wow. Which so. well, I, 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 that's actually fascinating. I, I, you know, seriously, I, I, I'm actually feeling a little better. See, good. see, we're working on better. you. It's but good. you know, honestly, I, I also think that people are constitutionally optimists or pessimists to some degree, and I think part of my problem, maybe if you want to call it a problem, is that. Um, 
I am constitutionally an optimist. And I think I get that from my mother, who it, it always has something good to say about every person in every situation. And so if anything, it's something I think I need to guard against. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? being too but, optimistic. Yeah, but yet at the same time, I mean, I went through this whole process of writing this book, and I talked to a lot of people, and I read a lot of studies. And a lot of what I did was uh, I had this whole section called uh, A Brief History of the Future, where I read predictions about the future written in the past like what people were saying about now 200 years ago and 100 years ago. I read a lot of that, and there's a section in the book called A Brief History of the Future. And I saw that, um, no, I concluded nobody can predict the future 100 years from now, not climate modelers, not futurists, not engineers, um, because it's always the game changers that come along and uh, in this very nonlinear way completely change everything. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got to act based on the knowledge we have and the path we have and do the best we can so that those, you know, those smart kids coming up now um, can take over the world in a, in a um, more hopeful position. But um, I'm optimistic because my reading of history partly tells me that um, there's all kinds of room for surprising changes, mm -hmm. and some of them are going to be good, and we're going to take advantage of them. Now, you know what you just uh, sparked in me a very, uh, <clears throat> this is just a thought exercise, but I'm interested to hear from both of you since you're so extremely knowledgeable on this. Is it possible? Well, forget, that's stupid to say, is it possible? But what is the likelihood that what you just said, and you're talking about uh, no one can predict the future because it's really disruptors that come along and change the path of human history. Absolutely. Someone comes along with a just this monumental epic disruption that causes, you know, a tectonic change socially, politically, e economically, period. How, how likely is it? that the problem itself becomes the uh, womb or the seeds for the solution itself. So we get right. to a place where we have to come up with an answer, and then someone who is solely dedicated to finding that answer comes along like an Einstein in 19-whatever and says, you know what? Here's, here's what, here's what we should do. Or, you know what, this might be the case. You ever think there might be something called gravity waves, like, or, uh, yeah, gravitational sure. waves? Okay, and then, boom, that's that. So if, if it weren't for the problem, we would never have the answer. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? I think it's extremely likely because, I mean, right now, there's huge economic incentive for somebody. If somebody could invent some process that removes carbon dioxide from the air and also makes stuff we want. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do have a we do have we know of something that does that. It's called a leaf, right? <laughs> uh, uses solar energy, takes right. CO2 out of the air and right. makes stuff we want, food, fuel. But if somebody could invent something that does that easily and could be you know, used on a massive scale, that person would probably be famous and rich. Right. Um, there's huge incentive. There's no bigger problem right now that there's big incentive to solve. And there's so many smart people around the world that sometime in the next, in the coming decades, there's going to be uh, some breakthroughs along those lines. Hmm. You know, in, in a larger sense, something I write about in the book is that, is that, um, the problem is the, is the same as the solution in the sense that, what the, our problem is our inventiveness. We've, we're so clever at, at cooperating in groups and inventing new technologies and changing our environment that we inadvertently changed the planet. And it's those same qualities that we need to now apply on a larger scale, our ability to cooperate and be inventive and consciously change our environment on a global scale. Mm. So in a certain sense, we need to do more of what we've done that got us into this mess or do it in a larger way, not just stop doing it. But wow. building, by building on things beyond simple inventiveness, the connectedness part depends on who you see as, as the we. And one thing I've learned, I've written about this a lot lately, is that uh, uh, even though we're all the same species, uh, there is no we when it comes to access to energy right now on the planet. You know, you know, right. they, uh, there's the the we of the the hundreds of millions of people in India who have a 1.9 ton per person per year carbon footprint. 1.9. We're 17 tons per person mm -hmm. here. So wow, you, you know, and that's just like one way to measure <coughs> the differentials, uh, you know, equity, economic inequality. So fostering the ability for, for an idea to, to be shared and shaped 
but making sure it's a fair playing field that's open, you know, so that the sharing and shaping is um, beneficial. Not, not, not like in an enforced way, mm -hmm. but so that that dynamic of like the response diversity thing, everyone just kind of, yeah. so that things can flow. Um, and then, you know, we've invented our way into a lot of some problems too, you know, nuclear power, we've created nuclear weapons right. and, and, um, and now we need to invent our way ethics, out of them. <laughs> so the ethical, without some real work on the ethics of this, it gets that that's a challenge yeah. too in the end. Wow. Are, these are great questions. Who, who is the we? Uh, that is that could be a whole other uh, a whole episode other <laughs> yeah. of Star Talk All Stars. And I would love to just keep talking all night. It's so great having you on, Andy. Andrew Revkin, and it's great talking with, with Chuck Nice. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, oh, man. and we're going to have to wrap this up. But um, we, meaning <laughs> Chuck and myself and Andy, have had a great time um, talking with all of you, the Star Talk listeners. And until next time, I'm David Grinspoon, and I would like to uh, just tell you to uh, keep it funky. And this has been Star Talk All Stars. <laughs> Bill Nye here, <laughs> and I'm here to talk to you about what I think is a very exciting thing. The Solutions Project is started by a bunch of civil engineers who have done an analysis of our wind and solar resources, our geothermal and tidal resources, and we strongly believe that we can power the whole U.S. and over 100 countries around the world renewably right now if we just got started. Now, my understanding is this Facebook Live is live. So you can send us charming and enchanting questions and I will do my best to answer them in an enchanting and charming fashion. Mm. Uh, am I right, Chuck? You are correct, Chuck sir. Chuck Nice is right here. I, I am there indeed. He Hello. Hello, Facebook Live. Hey, this is uh, James uh, Krungnail who says, Hey, Bill, what did you think of the House Science Committee tweeting a climate denier story about how global temperatures were plunging? Oh, the poor guys. Yeah, man. They have a lot of trouble with the facts. So here's what happened. It's winter time that's coming. So it's getting cooler. What? So, so some surface temperatures in North America are going down. What? The word plummet, a little bit of an exage. BTW, as the kids say, <laughs> by the way. By the way. It was generally believed that 2016 would be a cooler year than uh, 2015 because La Nina is, su is supplanting El Nino. And so uh, what's... What's happening is 2016 is going to be warmer than 2015. 2016 will be the hottest year on record. Now, if you're out there whining climate denier, excuse me, my fellow citizens, yeah. about climate change, I will bet you, if you're out there, I offered this to two different climate change deniers. I offered you 10,000 bucks that 2010, 2016 will be the hottest year on record. If you think hottest decade on record, 2010, 2020, I mean, excuse mm -hmm. me, 2010, 2020, sorry, people talking to me, threw me off. 2010, 2020 will be the hottest decade on record. If you think that this one tweet based on senseless interpretation of an oncoming winter season mm -hmm. indicates that for some reason, all that we know about the earth and planets is not true and you're willing to bet me 10,000 bucks then let me know Ooh. 2010 2020 will be the hottest decade on record the gauntlet has been thrown oh, I've down. thrown it down before none of these clowns the will take it the gauntlet has been thrown none of these, down none of these fellow citizens Ooh. will take it where your money at yeah so that's okay I, I don't blame you for not taking it because <laughs> my side of it is what we in the modern world call fact based right now I'm here for you man that's what we want to do is take positive steps to address climate change uh, you can hate me you can hate Al Gore, you can hate everything, it's fine. But what we want to do is take positive steps to address climate change. And the energy policy and climate policy are intimately connected. We need to change our electrical grid a little bit so that instead of relying on centralized power plants only to distribute electricity, the grid would be creating electricity everywhere. In Iowa, a very conservative state, had a fabulous time in Iowa, love the Iowa, love my popcorn by way of example. 
uh, they get, you guys get 25% of your energy, from, of your electricity from the wind. Texas, 10% of your electricity from the wind. This is competing directly with fossil fuels without subsidy. This is just doing it. So you guys check it out. It's not magic. It's science. Science. So let's do this. And by the way, you know, just the climate denier thing, you guys just, I appreciate how concerned you are. You have friends in the fossil fuel industry. You may be a coal miner yourself. You may work in the oil industry yourself, as I once did as a young engineer. I understand. <clears throat> but you guys, we have to get away from fossil fuels. And we have the energy in the wind and the sun, the tides and geothermal and the heat of the earth to run the place. We have another question. Chuck, you're sure. leaning in. Here we go. Uh, Abigail Brady, uh, Bill wants to know this. How long does the human species have if we continue to burn fossil fuels at the current rate? Is there a tipping point, Bill? Well, is people there? talk about the tipping point yes. all the time. Yes. And I don't know when it is, but here's the thing, you guys. It's it's lowering the quality of life for m hundreds of millions and reasonably billions of people. Yes. Here's the deal. Half of us live on the ocean shores. We're not bad people. They, that's where commerce is done, is on seashores. Now, the ocean is getting bigger because it's getting warmer. How can that be? Well, when things get warmer, they get bigger. They expand. Now, if the ocean is huge, and the temperature change is not very big, but it's big enough so that as the ocean gets bigger, it will encroach on the shorelines. Places like Norfolk, Virginia, Pensacola, Florida, Galveston, Texas. These are all going to encounter storms and tides that are in New York City going to get tides that are higher and higher and there's going to be this much water on the floor in Miami. Miami Beach is a wealthy community. They're throwing money at it for 20 or 30 years to preserve certain neighborhoods by pumping water away. But water's coming in through the limestone underneath. So people in the lower income neighborhoods are going to go somewhere. They're not going to be able to stay where they are with this much water on the floor. Where are they going to go? Who's going to pay for it? So let's get to work on this, everybody. Let's work together. This should not be a political problem. This should be a citizen's problem. And by the way, we want to have jobs domestically, no matter where you are. If you're watching in the United States, the United Kingdom, if you're watching in Australia, you want your jobs to be local. So wind and solar energy have to be built, those, that infrastructure has to be built locally. You might make turbine blades in another country and import them to your country, but when you go to put up the wind turbine, you have to do it there. It's all good. This is Ling Cullen, and Ling Cullen says uh, from Facebook Live, uh, what is the one thing that a normal everyday person can do to help improve scientific knowledge for their community instead of waiting for the government to lead the way? Good question, Ling. Well, here's the thing. I, uh, I have a house in Southern California, and I have four kilowatts of solar panels. I have insulated the house uh, with existing technology, nothing extraordinary. I, I got the nice windows. And my electric bill every 60 days is 10 bucks. That's just fun. It's just, just cool. So what I tell everybody is your windows. If you can do something to make your windows more energy efficient, it's uh, you'll save money. And of course, it'll be better for the environment and all that stuff, all those things writ large. And this is, this is a thing, it's a, it's a subtle thing, Chuck. Yes. Replacing light bulbs with more efficient light bulbs. Yes. More efficient lamps. Making your windows more efficient. It doesn't, it doesn't have a, a centralized industrial, all at once kind of solution flavor to it. It's distributed. distributed. And, and, and collectively, yeah. That's right. But if everybody's light bulbs use a 15th of the energy of old style light bulbs, then the power company, certain times a day, has 15 times as much electricity available for other cool stuff like mobile phones and the internet and this Facebook live broadcast. <laughs> so it's, it, it, the thing about it, it, it all adds up. And the trouble with the trouble with climate change in the big picture is it's in slow motion. You know, these changes are not happening like that. Like, both of my parents were veterans of World War II. I talk about this happen uh, often. On December 7th, 1941, everything changed. On 9-11, 2001, everything changed catastrophically. But climate change is slower, but nevertheless, it's still happening. And we've got to get to work on it as soon as we can. And I remind us 
that in World War II, everybody got together and solved the problem. Everybody was singing the songs about winning the war. Everybody was riveting uh, the aircraft. Everybody was working on solving this problem. So we can do this. Humankind has the ability to do this. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, let me just say that there is a ton of love for you here on Facebook Live, and uh, I can't tell you how many people say, Bill Nye, please run for president. I mean, there's oh, no, I, there I, are a lot of, there's a lot of please run for president. I would run for here. president, but I just tell you, normally, nominally, you want somebody running for president who has some experience in government, someone who knows what it takes to get a bill passed through Congress, someone who knows how to make agreements, real ones, mm -hmm. not wave of the arm, pie in the sky. Running a business is very different from running a government. Well, oof, you gosh. can't just, when you have a government, you can't just do things because it affects people. You can't just move a factory from one place to another because the other place has congressmen and senators that are expressed concern. Can we say concern? Yes, we can. So it's a different thing. Running a business is not the same as running a government. And I think we're all going to learn that <laughs> in, uh, in, a, in a big way. Let's go. Yes, Chuck, you have another question. Uh, yeah, this is Lee Joseph who says, Hi, Bill. Politicians don't seem to ever heed scientific warnings about climate change in North America. Do you think having a scientific leader would help better our planet rather than someone, and he goes on, uh, which I think is a good point. Do we need like a scientific leader? Like, you know, someone who's a point person who like can- Like Neil deGrasse Tyson? <laughs> Like, kind of like maybe host of Star Talk, host of Star Talk, host of Star Talk or maybe an All Star guest host, yeah. like me. Like yeah, maybe. But just here's what we would like. I want you to consider out there if we had a science advisor that was taken seriously. And I think the conservatives know this better than anybody. Climate change denial is largely age related. There are very few young people who are in denial about climate change. Okay. And everybody who studies this stuff in the United States, I don't know where you're watching, has seen this map. If only millennial people had voted, then the recent presidential election would have gone the other way. And millennial aged people are younger than. Uh, are younger yeah. than the people than many of the people who vote in the re recent election. So yeah, that anybody in this room. coming. If it didn't happen this time, it'll happen the next time or the time after, and everybody can see that. So sooner or later, we're all going to be on the same climate change page. So why don't we get on that page right now? Mara Houston, who says, I try to lead by example to my kids, but what more can I do to show my kids the importance of environmentalism? I love the fact that she said, show my kids. How, what's, what's, rather what's, than tell. Rather than tell my They're kids. They're watching you. The yeah, kids are always watching you. So the, I don't know where you live, Mara, but the single biggest decision decision that we make here in the United States is what car you choose to drive. Ooh. The more efficient vehicle you drive, the better. And I say to everybody, after you have an electric car, you never go back. I'm not saying everybody needs to get a Tesla. That's a lot of money. But there are other electric vehicles that you'll be surprised. You seldom drive 500 miles at a time, 300 miles at a time, very seldom. So consider that. And then the other thing is, is just turn off the lights. I'm not kidding. Turn off the lights. Don't run the thermostat higher in the winter than you need to, colder in the summer than you need to. And uh, just do more with less. You'll find that you can do it. This is not that hard. But in the big picture, everybody, I want you to think about creating a new infrastructure in the United States where we use renewably produced electricity to run our society. And then we can run over 130 countries around the world. Check out the solutionsproject.org. Thank you so much for joining us on Facebook Live. We can do this, people. We can change the world. Thank you, Chuck Nice. Blow it up. You know it. This is Star Talk.